Good morning. My name is Tom Geckler. I'm Chief Practice Officer with Ide Bailey, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled SBA and Other Relief Efforts Related to Recent Legislation Surrounding the COVID-19 Pandemic. This material, as you all are aware, is very fast moving and based on the nearly 4,000 participants in today's webinar, very important to a lot of people. Presenting today, we have Adam Sweet, a principal in our Spokane, Washington office and part of our national tax office, as well as Michael Holdren, a senior manager in our Des Moines, Iowa office. These two gentlemen have spent countless hours from last Friday when the CARES Act was passed to all the way up to the middle of the night last night when the new PPP loan application was published, just in order to get ready to provide you the most up-to-date information on this subject. Shortly after today's session, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar and access to additional insights on the Ide Bailey website. If you have any questions or need assistance, please complete the SBA relief request in the provided email. Finally, if you're new to joining us and not familiar with Ide Bailey, we are a top 20 CPA firm with over 40 offices in 15 states. We are committed to providing our clients with clarity and solutions on the topics covered today, as well as many other. Thanks again for joining us and I'll turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Tom. And welcome everyone today. I, I see we already have questions piling in. And I just say, typically we try to get the questions. I don't think it's gonna be possible today just to the sheer volume of requests. So what I'd encourage everyone to do to the extent that you're a current Ide Bailey client, reach out to your local Ide Bailey professional. If you're not an Ide Bailey client, maybe uh, reach out to us and we can connect you with who would be your local professional. And we'll make some attempt as well at the end of this to collate the questions. And if they're common questions, then I think we'll try to answer those and get them out to the group. But we apologize if you submit a specific question and we don't answer it. It's just due. Typically we're able to do it, but I just don't think it'll be possible today. Those of you that are new to Ide Bailey, we have a dedicated webpage just to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's, it's a really kind of a go-to webpage for business resources, both tax-related and non-tax-related. Everything that you should be thinking about if you're a business, if you're an individual and you've been affected by this pandemic, which is pretty much everyone, I'd encourage you to go to this website and see what we have to offer. But in terms of today, our agenda today, if we have enough time, hoping to cover all four of these topics, it may be that we really only cover the first topic, and I think that's okay because that's probably why most people dialed in today was really the first topic. So the Paycheck Protection Program, which is what everyone's been reading about in the news, about the loans from the SBA that are possibly forgivable. There's also another component called Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, EIDL program. There are also some employer-focused tax provisions and then there are also some individual provisions, but I would guess today we're gonna to spend probably 90, 95% of our time on this first one, this Paycheck Protection Program. If we have time, we'll move on to the uh, two through four. If we don't have time, they're still in the slide deck. So I'd encourage you to uh, review that deck when you have time and there's good information on these other programs. So just how did we get here? It's, it's amazing, you think about it, it's April 3rd now and everything that's happened even in the last month so on March 13th, President Trump declared a, the coronavirus pandemic a national emergency beginning March 1st, 2020. Once the president does that, that triggers all kinds of things. You know, one example of it is the delayed IRS filing that has been in the news that for most people now their tax returns are due July 15th. So that's an example of once a national emergency is declared, all of these other things that can follow from it. Five days later, we had the first piece of stimulus legislation passed by the, it was, came from the House, obviously passed by the House and the Senate, but came from the House. And it was called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And it's a $183 billion package. That was focused primarily on providing sick leave credits, sick leave benefits to employers, uh, so that if people have been affected by the virus, that they could still receive compensation. 10 days later, nine days later, we received the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, so-called CARES Act, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And you know, we had 183 billion with the first, they upped it to two trillion with this act that was passed last week. 
And as probably most people, if you've read in the news, that it's very likely we're going to have further stimulus, and it may be even fur further stimulus that runs to the north of $2 trillion. So I just encourage everyone to stay tuned to all of this, because a lot of what Congress does when they provide aid and stimulus, they do it in one form or another through the tax system, either through credits or rebates and so forth. So undoubtedly, we may be back here in a couple of weeks having another webinar on the third piece of uh, stimulus passed by Congress. But let's talk specifically today, I guess this is again why most people are here, the Paycheck Protection Program, and we call it the PPP. It was introduced as part of the CARES Act, so that was passed about 10 days ago. CARES Act is about $2 trillion program. The PPP is a $349 billion program that is part of the larger CARES Act. It's temporary, so that's a key fact, and hopefully temporary, hopefully that we just need it here for a couple of months and then it is not re-upped. It is not a brand new program. It is, they decided to administer this PPP program through the existing Small Business Administration's loan program. It's the so-called 7A loan program. The PPP is a new component of the 7A loan program, but we already have the larger 7A program on the books. It's fast moving. You know, we had the CARES Act nine days ago. Tom mentioned late last night, we had regulations from the SBA that actually had some material changes to this program. And it's pertinent to everyone because supposedly we haven't heard of anyone yet that's been successful, but supposedly the PPP program starts today, that you could actually go to a bank today and submit an application. So if you do that timeline, nine days ago, we get the CARES Act that says $349 billion is going to go through this PPP program. We get some updated forms. You know, everyone's parsing the statute, parsing these updated forms. We get regs late last night, and then supposedly this morning, you could be submitting an application to a bank. Now, we're going to have more on that later about really, is that feasible? Is that realistic? Where are the banks at and all this? We have more later on on that. So what are the major components? If I, if I broke it down, here's how I would describe it. I'd say the first component of the PPP is a loan and it's administered through an SBA approved lender. So that's the first major thing. You don't actually go to the SBA, you don't apply on the SBA's website, you go through a local SBA approved lender. And again, that's my reference to the existing SBA program. There's, there's been small business administration loans probably for the last 20, 30 years. So there's already a network of approved lenders in most communities. So you get the loans, the first component. The second component is if you do certain things and make certain uses of the loan proceeds, all or a portion of the loan can be forgiven. So you'll see as we go through our presentation that really the statute in a way or the rules in a way cover each of these separately. There's a separate group of definitions for the loan. There's a separate group of, of rules for the loan. And then secondly, if you want forgiveness, there's a whole another section of rules and a whole another section of definitions. So first of all, who's eligible? So we have this $349 billion loan program, you know, potentially it's forgivable. Everyone in the whole country is interested. I can certainly say probably 95% of our clients, you know, this was the busiest week, at least for me of my career. And I think even Tom had mentioned, Tom's been, in, been at it a few more years, but I think even for himself, he mentioned that, that this was, his phone was just nonstop ringing in emails. And most of it was clients, saying, I want a part of this somehow, some way. So the first question is, who is eligible? And this is when we get into the definitions. So during the covered period, which is a defined term, to run from February 15th through June 30th, 2020, any small business concern, any business concern, any nonprofit organization, any veterans organization, or any tribal business concern is eligible if, one, employs not more than 500 employees or two, the applicable size standard established for certain industries. And we're gonna get into both of these a little bit later. Also included in the definition of eligible participants is sole proprietors. So we think about these as uh, Schedule C, if you just have a single member LLC and you report your income expenses on your own tax return. Independent contractors, so people receiving 1099 payments, and eligible self-employed individuals, all included. And if you say, well, what is, who is an employee for purposes of the 500 uh, employees? The answer is both full and part-time. 
So what can you take away from that? Well, what you can take away from that is a huge swath of American business is probably eligible for the PPP loan program. Now there's some other details we're gonna get to. It doesn't mean you're gonna automatically get the loan and it doesn't mean you're automatically gonna get loan forgiveness, but you certainly could be eligible. I'd say probably 95%, you know, 90, 95% of Ide Bailey business clients uh, will potentially be eligible just based on this employee standard. Two other points on this, that there's existing SBA guidance pre-PPP. There's existing SBA guidance that refers to either a net worth requirement or to a net income requirement. That is under the old SBA programs, generally doesn't apply for the PPP program. So you may talk to a lender, you may talk to a friend, you may even talk to a banker, and their experience may be on the, the former SBA program. And they may say, well, there's a net worth requirement, you're not gonna qualify or there's a net income requirement, you're not gonna qualify. That is not true for the PPP program. True for other SBA programs, but not true for the PPP program. And Adam, I'll, I'll jump in quick, just on the, uh, on the size standards um, as well. As Adam mentioned, the eligibility requirement is generally the 500 or fewer employees, but the SBA does have established size standards based on the North American Industry Classification System or the NAICS. And these standards can be found on the Electronic Code of Federal Reg Regulations via the SBA website. And why this is important is certain industries are allowed to have more than 500 employees based on the small business size standards uh, established by the SBA. So for instance, a farm machinery and equipment manufacturing organization <laughs> can have up to 1,250 employees. Uh, and in that type of case, you would rely on the higher number of uh, employees. So um, if your industry has an employee threshold higher than 500, you could still qualify as a small business. Also important to note, um, building on Adam's previous comment, under this NAICS system, there are some industries that have an annual revenue uh, designation for small business guidance, that is ignored under the PPP plan. In those cases, if you look up your industry and you see an annual revenue threshold, you would revert back to the 500 employee threshold. Um, so the, the, the general rule of thumb is going to be 500 or less unless the NAICS standard allows for more than 500 employees. Maybe, maybe Michael, what are some of the common examples we've seen there? For instance, um, just yesterday, we had a call with uh, one of our clients. Um, again, this is kind of in the, the ag and, and farming industry. They were uh, chicken uh, manufacturing or pr production. Um, they had 1,200 employees, um, and we were able to look up on the Electronic Code of Federal Reg Regulation that they, they too also have a 1,250 employee threshold. So initially, they thought they weren't going to be able to participate in the PPP a loan program, but um, they are eligible based on that NAICS designation. That's right. And so that's a, and that's a pretty big exception there that you think 500 employees, yet someone with 1,200 employees potentially qualifies because of their specific industry. So when you, we talk about how to measure 500 employees, there's uh, unfortunately some rules of affiliation. So what this generally means, we're not going to do a deep dive today into the SBA's affiliation rules. But what it basically means is you could have several businesses that could be grouped together for purposes of the 500 employee test to the extent that they're either under common control or common management. And those are a, a bit loaded terms, defined terms. We're not gonna get into it today, but there's, it's a pretty broad based test, this affiliation. So that you could have two businesses that each employ 400 people. And so you would think on its own, the business would qualify, yet there's a common control group or there's common management or another affiliation factor. And suddenly you have a business with 800 employees and you don't qualify. But then like everything that Congress does, we have the rule, we have the exception, which is more than 500 employees. But of course, then we get the exceptions to the exceptions. And one example of this is if you if you're affiliated group of companies and you employ not more than 500 employees per physical location 
and you're assigned the NICS code, which Michael just talked about in the last side, which is kind of an industry classification code, beginning with 72, then you can escape this affiliation rule. Even though you may have 10 or 20 different locations, if each of those locations is less than 500 employees, you can escape affiliation even if you have common control or common management. Uh, if you're curious about code and NAICS code 72, you can Google it, but generally what it relates to is a combination of food services. So you can think about it here, this is for really the hospitality industry who's been particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You know, the, think about your, your favorite hotel chain across America that's now at 99% vacancy. This is for them because otherwise, because of the common control that often exists for these hospitality groups, they'd otherwise get caught by the affiliation the affiliation rules, but here we have this exception. And then another exception is any business operating as a franchise that's assigned a franchise identifier code uh, by the SPA. And maybe Michael, if you can give us kind of a flavor of what that means. Sure, so this is another important exception um, that the CARES Act does provide. Um, there's numerous businesses that operate under franchise agreements and when aggregated under, under common ownership or common control, wouldn't meet that 500 employee threshold. However, if your franchise is listed on the SBA franchise directory, you are provided this exception. You can find the SBA's franchise directory um, on the SBA's website. And a common example that we've seen um, specifically at I Bailey is we work with a number of automotive dealerships. So for instance, uh, we have common ownership of multiple Ford dealerships. Um, so an aggregated under the affiliation rule under the standard SBA guidelines, many times they have more than 500 employees, but they are listed on the SBA franchise directory. So they'd be allowed to participate in the PPP loan program. Now it's our understanding that you can apply to be added to the SBA franchise directory. Uh, and we do understand that many businesses are submitting applications to get added to the directory. So if you do operate under a franchise um, arrangement, that might be an option um, that you wanna consider. If you are not listed under the franchise directory, you would be subject to those uh, general affiliation rules uh, in terms of aggregating your number of employees. So along with that, so if, if you cross the, or if you're under the 500 employee, another requirement here, and you're gonna see that this is, this is, there's not a lot of teeth to this requirement, but that if you're eligible, you have to make a good faith certification that the loan is necessary due to the uncertainty of current economic conditions caused by COVID-19 that you will use the funds to retain workers and maintain payroll, lease, and utility payments and focus on that second bullet because we have more to come on that and that are not receiving duplicative funds from another SBA program. And just to emphasize that point there too that I made in the beginning that you, again, you may Google SBA loans and find a whole bunch of information that may not be relevant for the PPP program because it's old SBA guidance or it's guidance that relates to the general SBA program. So just be aware of that. But otherwise, making this good faith certification, I would guess for most people, this is not going to be difficult to, to certify because especially if you're in a state that's at a stay home order or a shelter in place order and your business, you know, is partially operational or not operational at all, well, then I think you're going to meet that standard. So how much can you borrow? So if you're eligible, first question was eligible. Second question is great. I'm eligible. So how much can I get? And the, during the covered period, which is the period from February to June 30th, the maximum loan, and it's a lesser of equation, so you can borrow up to $10 million or, and then this is the limiting factor, if you were operational in 2019, two and a half times your average monthly payroll costs, and payroll costs is bolded and underlined because it's a defined term that we'll get to in a second, that you incurred during the year prior to the loan date. Now there's different interpretations of this. Some people, when they read the statute, the year prior, they'd read it as a rolling year. The government has in indicated in a couple of things that really they're referring to the 2019 tax year. And that may just be because that's the year that they have information and it, the government has information in terms of payroll that if you did the rolling year up until the application date, maybe the government doesn't have recent information. If you weren't operational in 2019, don't despair. You can use your payroll, two and a half times your payroll costs 
incurred in January and February of 2020. And if you're a seasonal business, don't despair. That There's a separate rule just for seasonal businesses. And you can choose either the February 15th to March 1st, 2019 period or period ending on June 30th, 2019. So a whole three different limiting factors. You can borrow up to 10 million. For most people, they're probably not going to get to 10 million. Instead, what they're going to get to is the two and a half times payroll down below. So then we know, so if we know it's 10 million or it's the lesser of 10 million or two and a half times payroll, and we know depending on if you're seasonal or what, what your payroll period is. So then the next question is, what are payroll costs? And they give us a definition for payroll costs. For employees, if you have employees, payroll costs are salary, wage, commission, or a similar arrangement, cash tips, or the equivalent, vacation, sick leave, health and retirement benefits, and state and local tax assessed on compensation. So think your state unemployment, state insurance, that type of stuff. If you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, what's your payroll? Because typically it could be a wage, although a lot of times if you're a sole proprietor, you don't, you don't pay yourself a wage, you just have your 1099. So it's wage, commission, income, net earnings from self-employment or similar compensation. If you're a sole proprietor, you can't include an amount that is more than $100,000 in one year is prorated. So when we talk about the two and a half times multiple, you're capped at 100 grand. What doesn't count, so if I flip back and forth here, the payroll cost for sole proprietors, payroll cost for employees, if we focus on employees, what doesn't count? Compensation of an individual employee in excess of an annual salary of 100 grand as prorated doesn't count. Payroll taxes, something FICA, doesn't count. Income tax withholding doesn't count. If the employee lives outside the USA, doesn't count. Also, if you have sick leave that's generating a credit under the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, which is that first piece of stimulus legislation that I referenced past a couple of weeks ago, doesn't count. One open question here, and maybe I shouldn't even say open question because I think we have a position on it, but there's some confusion, is this $100,000 cap. The statute and the regulations that came out tell us that that $100,000 cap only applies to the first bullet, salary, wage, and commission. So if you paid someone 120 grand, you could use 100, 100 grand of the wage then you could add vacation, sick leave, health retirement benefits on top of that, and maybe you could come up with a payroll multiple over 100 grand. There's been some conflicting guidance though from the Treasury Department and the SBA, because in a couple of places they have said payroll costs, which is the larger defined term, is capped at 100 grand, not just salary wage. I don't think that's a correct reading of the statute, but you may see that and you may even hear that from your banker or from your lender if you go in for the loan, so be prepared to you know, potentially have to argue or point out why it's not payroll costs, it's, it's one of the components of payroll costs. And that could, be, that could have a material impact. When we're talking about two and a half times payroll, that could have a material impact to the amount of the loan, to your disadvantage, you know, to, the, to the taxpayer, to the applicant's disadvantage. So if we're gonna do the loan steps, in short here, what would you do if you're trying to figure out how much you can borrow? Well, you'd aggregate your payroll costs from the last 12 months, for employees whose principal place of residence is the United States, you'd back out the uh, annual compensation in excess of 100 grand for employees or for commissions 1099 payments for independent contractors. So you have an equation, so one minus two, whatever your resulting amount is, you divide that by 12 to get your annual, your monthly rate, and then you'd multiply by two and a half times, and that's gonna give your tentative loan amount. So if you do all that and you say, great, now I figured out how much I can borrow, you know, I'm eligible one, then I figured out how much I can borrow, then it's the question is, what can I do with the cash? So if I get a loan for a million bucks or a hundred grand or two million bucks or whatever it is, what am I allowed to do with the cash? And this is where the new guidance comes in and is contradictory. The statute tells us that you can use your loan for payroll, healthcare benefits, salaries, commissions, interest on a mortgage obligation, rent, utilities, or interest on a debt obligation incurred before the covered period. So, and they don't tell us 
that you have to pay a certain percentage. In other words, they don't say that 100% are, they, they don't say that, that 50% of it's got to go to payroll. If you read the statute, you, it, it would appear that you could use 100% of the loan for any of these particular categories. The new regulations that came out last night, or I guess they call it the new guidance that came out last night, tells us that at least 75% of the PPP loan proceeds shall be used for payroll costs. So that's a big game changer because our, our uh, advice to a lot of people as of before yesterday was to go in, borrow as much as you can borrow, get through this difficult period. If you've borrowed too much or if you don't get it forgiven, we're going to talk about forgiveness in a second, but if you end up with a, with a pot of money that you couldn't use, uh, or that you use for another purpose, you could consider paying it back, or maybe you just pay it back uh, over two years. So no penalty. But if we're required to use 75% of it for a payroll, and that's not possible because we've laid off people, or just due to our business structure, that isn't, you know, our monthly expenditures typically aren't 75% dedicated to payroll. Well, that could influence then how much you're going to borrow. Because along with it, they gave a Q&A that said, that seemed to indicate that if you knowingly violated this, so if you knowingly spent more that are less than 75% of the loan proceeds on payroll, that that could be an indication of fraud. And that would be a problem because that could potentially make you personally liable for the loan. I know this is, this is probably springing all kinds of questions in people's heads. Uh, we have those same questions. I just uh, would caution, we, this was sprung on us last night and we were all thinking about right now how this will play out. Michael, maybe give us kind of a quick example here of how this might work. Sure, so here we have a, a, a fairly simple example. We have a small business with 15 employees and an owner manager. So going through the calculation that Adam just went through, we're gonna aggregate our allowable payroll costs over the last 12 months. So in this case, we've got 750,000 in payroll. We divide that by 12 to come up with our average monthly payroll of 62,500. But our owner manager had salary in excess of 100,000 and that amount was 50,000. So we have to subtract that amount from our payroll costs, which is gonna reduce the, the average monthly payroll cost by a little over $4,000. So our total average monthly payroll costs uh, on the calculation is 58,333. We multiply that times two and a half to come up with an eligible loan amount of 145,833. One thing to point out, um, guidance that came out last night, I know I've seen some questions kind of flowing through um, on the EIDL loans. If you are a small business and you took out an economic injury <laughs> disaster loan during the period of January 31st through today, that amount can be added to the eligible loan amount. So if you had a $40,000 EIDL loan, you can add that to the 145,833. So your eligible loan amount would be 185,833. But it's only if you took out the EIDL loan during that period of January 31st through today. Yeah, and more, the EIDL, I was just gonna say, the EIDL loans that Michael mentioned, I know there's been a lot of questions about these. We'll see if we have time to get to them. They're separate from the PPP. So two separate loan programs with potentially two separate uses. So just uh, keep that in mind. I've seen a lot of questions. Hopefully we get to it today. But if you don't, just remember that they're two separate things. All right, other loan details. And this is, again, where you may Google SBA loans and you may find out, you may find all this conflicting information about SBA loans. I think traditionally, SBA loans were not a popular route. Michael, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but I know you used to work at a bank, but I mean, traditional SBA loan programs, or as a business person, would they have been kind of a loan of last resort or not, not under the current program, but under the previous program? Absolutely. And, and in most, and I, under the traditional SBA program, they would have had to have certified that they weren't eligible to get financing somewhere else under the, the, the traditional program. So um, these were generally um, borrowers that, that needed funding, um, whether it was for working capital or, or to purchase certain equipment, but they weren't able, based on their current financial situation, to qualify under regular underwriting standards. Michael, in his 
previous life was a CFO of a bank. So part of the reason why we have them on here today is to give some of that background. But yeah, so loan details, most fees waived, no personal guarantee. So it's generally non-recourse unless you commit fraud. No, you don't have to show that you can't get credit elsewhere. The statute tells us that the interest rate's not to exceed 4%. What's interesting though, last night, the guidance that came out says that the loan is 1% and for two years. And I have a typo there. I apologize. It's two yays. It should be two years. The guidance from a couple of days ago said that the loan rate was 0.5%. So this seems to be a moving target. If you borrow, you can defer payment for six months, not the interest, but you can defer payment. And then from the lender side of things, if they uh, make a covered loan, that loan can be sold on the secondary market to generate liquidity. So this is really probably, this is the second part of the program. I, you know, I talked about in the very beginning, we have the loan and so far we've covered who's eligible, how much you can borrow, what can you do with the loan? The second part about it, and probably the part, the reason why most people are very interested in this is potentially the loan can be forgiven for whole or in part, so free money potentially. So everything bolded here is a defined term and everything bolded is an important term and we're gonna cover it uh, in subsequent slides. So eligible recipients shall be eligible for forgiveness of a covered loan equal to the sum of the following costs incurred during the covered period. So eligible recipients, covered loan and covered period. Those are our three key terms. And then the eligible costs are payroll costs. Payroll costs we've already defined, which was wages, salary, benefits, and so forth. Interest on a covered mortgage obligation. Covered mortgage obligation is defined as a liability incurred in the ordinary course of a trade or business on real personal property that was incurred before February 15, 2020. Payment on a covered rent obligation. Again, rent, you know, rent obligation you incurred before February 15, 2020, and then, or a covered utility payment for utilities that were in service before February 15, 2020. The, the curveball that was just thrown to us last night is that the non-payroll portion of the eligible expenses, if you want to generate loan forgiveness, is limited to 25%. So this mirrors the that you had to use 75% of the loan proceeds for payroll purposes. Also on the forgiveness side, you have to use 75% of the loan proceeds for payroll in order to get it forgiven. It's a curveball because that is not what the statute says. The statute doesn't discriminate those four bullets, sub bullets there, payroll, interest, and covered mortgage rent. There's no uh, preference for one over the other in the statute, but Treasury in its infinite wisdom or SBA in its infinite wisdoms decided that there is a preference and that their preference is to payroll. I mean, a little, facetious or making fun. I mean, really what they said was the focus of the program is to maintain payroll, keep people receiving checks. And so that's why they're keeping the focus here on the benefits. You get the benefits both of the loan and the forgiveness if you maintain payroll. So definitions, who is an eligible recipient? Well, that means you're a recipient of a covered loan. What's a covered loan? A loan guaranteed under the PPP, Pay Paycheck Protection Act. What is the covered period? It's the eight week period beginning on the date of the origination of a covered loan, which I think about it as the funding of the loan. So once you receive the loan in your, in the, in your bank or once it's in your checking account or savings account, that triggers the covered period and then you're tracking for the ne next eight weeks what you do with it. A couple other key terms, uh, loan forgiveness can't exceed the principal amount of the loan. I don't know how this would ever happen, but uh, maybe it's possible. And then also, the, I saw this question pop up earlier, but this is very taxpayer friendly. If it is forgiven, it does not represent cancellation of indebtedness income. So the loan, if you do the right thing with it and it's forgiven, it's basically free money with no tax consequences to it. One other point on that, if you borrow, it, it, it's not the end of the world. If you borrow more than what's forgiven, you know, that just turns into that two-year term loan we talked about. You know, it's at 0.5% not a bad term rate, and you can always prepay it too. So you end up with a, with a pile of money that's not forgiven, then you could always prepay the loan as well. Now that, that math, again, is cal that calculus has changed a little bit because 75% of the proceeds have to use towards payroll. If it didn't go to payroll, you know, you'd want to think about that a little bit, but potentially anyway, no, no penalty for prepayment. Correct, interest rate, I see all these comments on the right. Interest rate is 1%. It, they said 0.5% two days ago. That may be why 0.5% is coming through, uh, triggering a memory. 
but the interest rate is 1% right now. The reason why they did that was they're trying to get enough of a spread so that a lender could sell that onto the secondary market, that at 0.5%, they were worried that no one would be interested in purchasing a loan on the secondary market. So we, forgiveness, and so now we come to the exceptions. Uh, what, why, if you follow the letter of the law for the loan and the forgiveness, you could still have your forgiveness limited in a couple of situations. One is if you reduce the average number of full-time employees during the covered period, versus the period from last year, February 15th and June 30th, or this year, January 1st, 2020, and ending on February 29th, 2020, that could reduce, that, that will produce a factor, and we're not gonna do the math here, but that would produce a factor that would reduce the forgiveness. If you're seasonal, you can use the special period, February 15th to June 30th, 2019. Why is this here? Again, the whole focus of the program is to maintain your full-time your employee headcount. So if you laid off a bunch of people, potentially that could influence your forgiveness amount. But note one thing here that the focus is on average number of full-time employees. It's not any particular employee. So it doesn't mean that if you had the 10 employees last year, it needs to be the exact same 10 employees that are this year. They just talk about average number of full-time employees. Contrast that with the second bucket that could limit it. The, so the first bucket is if you've had a, a reduction in full-time headcount. The second bucket is if you've reduced total salary of any employee, and any should be, I should have underlined it there, during the covered period, and you've reduced their pay by more than 25% as compared to the most recent full quarter during which the employee was employed before the covered period, so before the loan, if you reduce their pay by more than 25%, that can also limit forgiveness. And note, note the focus there is on any employee. So it's not an average salary count. It's, uh, it's strange in a way that the full-time headcount limitation is based on average, yet the salary is based on specific. Also note that if anyone who's making over 100 grand, they're apparently kicked out in total from this equation. So they just, whereas before for salary, if you made over hundred grand, it's just the portion over hundred grand that doesn't count as part of payroll costs for this limiting factor for forgiveness. If you make over hundred grand, you just kicked out totally. So it would appear potentially that if someone was making over hundred grand, you could cut their pay to a dollar and it would not uh, hurt here. Also notice that if you cut someone's pay by 24%, potentially you're not uh, impacted by this limitation. So if, if anyone was, was contemplating a salary reduction, you might pay close attention to this and figure out, well, what's the amount we can cut salary and still not be punished? So then like every, every good statute, we have a rule, we have an exception, and then now we have the exception to the exception. So the rules forgiveness, the exception is if you don't maintain headcount or you cut salary, some of the forgiveness could be cut. But then of course, if you do certain things, you can get out of that cut. And the first one is if you've had a reduction in the number of full-time equivalent employees, so if you're caught up by that first category, if you bring them back by no later than June 30th, 2020, then you will not be penalized by the reduction in forgiveness. Now, if you bring them back right on June 30th, that would work. Now, the only problem there, of course, is, is that they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have been on your payroll during the covered period which would make it difficult for you to show that 75% of your costs from the, from the covered loan are going toward payroll. So you might be a little careful with thinking that I'm just gonna bring everyone back right on June 30th. But for purposes of the forgiveness anyways, you could do that. So that's a, that's a nice exception there for anyone that's laid off employees before the PPP program and before the forgiveness. There's a similar rule, sorry, I skipped ahead. Similar rule for if you've reduced salary if by the end of the covered period, if you bring people's salary back up to where they were pre, then you, don't, you will not be punished for it. It's interesting, the statute seems to say that you have to bring them, for the salary purposes, you have to bring them back up to 100% of where they were before, that every dollar below where they were before reduces the forgiveness. I'm done talking for a second. Maybe I turn this over to Michael to walk through a couple of examples. So sure, we have, uh, we have Continuing on from the small business example um, from earlier, we're going to assume that this small business had no layoffs or salary reductions. 
If that was the case, the forgiveness of the loan would be calculated as follows. We're going to look at that eight weeks following the loan origination. We're going to determine our payroll costs. And in this case, we had 116,667 in payroll costs. We're going to add to that covered expenses, rent, utilities, and interest on debt obligations incurred before February 15th. We're going to aggregate all those up. And our eligible tentative loan forgiveness is just under 140,000. In this case, since we had no layoffs or salary reductions, we would be eligible for that full forgiveness. When compared to the original balance um, from our previous example, the remaining residual loan after forgiveness would be just about $6,000. In this example, the rent utilities and interest um, are less than um, 25%. So all of those would be eligible um, in this case. However, if we move to the next slide, we can see what the effect would be if we did have some salary reduction or employee layoffs. So again, let's assume that three employees are laid off and one employee takes a 25% re over a 25% reduction in salary. So for the three employees that are laid off, that is viewed in proportion of the total employees at the beginning. So we had 16 total employees. We've laid three off. That re represents 18.75% of our total workforce. So our forgivable amount calculated of just under 140,000 is multiplied by the reduction in our workforce of 18.75%. So we would have to reduce our loan forgiveness by 26,188. Additionally, we would have to reduce dollar for dollar the employee salary cut that was in excess of 25%. So in this case, the employee took a $15,000 pay cut from 50,000 to 35. So that's also reduced from the loan forgiveness amount. So our total forgiveness amount is the 139 and change less the 26, 188, less the 15. So our total forgiveness is 98,479, which would leave us with a residual loan about amount of just over 47,000. So you can see how the reduction of employees or layoffs of employees um, certainly can have an impact. Now, if these employees were brought back on prior to June 30th and the level of salary was increased um, prior to June 30th, um, these forgiveness um, pieces would then be waived and you would be eligible for the full forgiveness um, based on the eligible costs that were incurred. So if I'm thinking about this as a small business, even if you took your loan out April 15th and your, your eight weeks is up June 15th, um, you're probably going to want to wait to uh, su submit your forgiveness application until after June 30th, um, just given the timing of when that covered period ends, just to make sure that your FTEs and your salaries um, can be calculated for the forgiveness appropriately. Thank you, Michael. Go to the next. So, how, and then how do you, you know, the next question would be, and this is going to be a ways off right now. Everyone's focused on the application side of things, receiving the money, but eventually here in the next couple of months, people are going to be interested in the forgiveness. So what do you do? Well, according to the statute, uh, you would submit to your lender. So you, you start with your lender to get the loan and they get the forgiveness. You would submit the following documentation to your lender, um, you know, document the number of full-time employees, their pay rates. You, know, you might use your payroll tax filings, state income tax, payroll and employment filings to support that, you know, documentation of qualified expenses. Uh, and remember that 75% of those need to be payroll. So different than what the statute says. Uh, and then you'd have to swear that everything is true and correct and that you basically use the money to retain employees and make certain qualified expenditures. This is probably going to be changed to that you use 75% of it to retain employees. And then there may be further documentation. I think right now what the SBA and what the government's focused on is getting information out about just the application side, just trying to get the loan. So maybe we'll see, they're doing triage, maybe we'll see more information on specific to how you, your loan's forgiven uh, in the coming weeks, because it will be relevant, but it's not relevant right this second. Here is the, this is hot off the press. This is the 
app, so just how do you do the loan itself? There's a form 2483 that's from the SBA that is the standardized application. We had a draft floating around earlier in the week, but this is the, I think, the final draft that was sent out last night. We're running a little short on time, so we won't have to focus on anything specific to it, but this just gives you a flavor for what it looks like. You could certainly Google Form 2483 and you could find the form yourself. I also would expect most lenders are also going to have this. And this is just the backside of it that, uh, one thing I'd just say, you can see that there's questions about affiliates. We talked about the affiliate questions in the beginning. So if you're worried, if you're worried about affiliation, you might do your diligence before you submit the application. And then on the back of it, there's a, you're swearing that you were operational and that you're going to use the funds for their intended purpose. And then you sign on the dotted line. One thing to add to that application, you may want to, if you have a specific bank that you anticipate working with, um, reach out to that bank or go to their website. They may have a form of this application um, with some of their certain um, disclosure language that's also included in, in uh, combination with the information that was pulled out from the treasury. So um, just bear in mind, just using the standard form from the treasury may not, um, may not coincide with what your actual bank is looking for for the application. And in terms of the actual rollout of the program, um, it does open up today. We, small businesses and sole proprietors can apply um, beginning today, uh, beginning a week from today, independent contractors and employed, uh, self-employed individuals can also uh, apply. We're not sure um, in, in terms of why there's the, the gap in, in terms of filing that was released by the treasury a couple days ago. And there will be other regulated lenders that um, can file the appropriate forms that aren't SBA approved lenders currently um, that will be able to uh, be enrolled and approved to, to facilitate loans under the PPP plan. Moving on to the next slide, in terms of how we anticipate the, the rollout of this, um, you know, with the updated guidance that just came out last night, um, we anticipate the rollout of the program today specifically and probably over the next few days to be pretty slow. Banks are still getting educated on these last minute changes and the clarifications as well as updating their internal documentation and applications. Guidance from the Treasury did indicate that this was first come first serve, but as Adam mentioned, uh, Secretary Mnuchin has made comments about asking for additional funding uh, if the appropriations are depleted. Um, from our bank clients, we've heard that they're, they're stressing the importance of businesses being prepared with the appropriate documentation necessary for the application process. Um, so the approval is as efficient as possible. Obviously, given the limitations of our ability to meet face to face with our bankers, the more prepared and documented um, you can be as a small business will make this process go more smoothly and more efficiently. Also, given the number of applications that are anticipated, delays in the SBA system um, limitations are quite possible. So again, um, our, our recommendation is, is be as prepared as you can with the documentation um, and the forms necessary, um, but also try and be as patient as you can. And, and that's obviously a difficult and considering the, the time that we're in. And I just I see a note from a panelist that said a major lender, Wells Fargo, will not be accepting applications today. I guess I would, that's probably not too surprising. Michael, would you agree? Yeah, I did see Bank of America. Um, I saw a notification that they are um, accepting applications. But again, if this is the banks weren't given the proper information until last night. So to really anticipate them um, being fully operational with this plan is is a little difficult, but uh, obviously, they're, they're working as hard as they can um, to get this funds distributed to the small businesses that are certainly in need of, of the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Because the way it works, it's actually the bank's cash, the bank's capital that's going out the door right now. And then the, it's guaranteed by the government. And then they eventually could sell these loans to the secondary market or sell it back to the government. But the banks are taking some risk up front because it's their capital. So they're nervous just given how fast moving this is and how many unknowns there are, they don't want to commit a footfall or get penalized and then end up with a bad loan on their books. So, and I think banks in the past, 
maybe have had mixed results sometimes with SBA programs. And so they're a little hesitant, even, even with these additional guarantees from the government, they're maybe perhaps a little hesitant to jump in with both feet until they know what these details are gonna be. Payroll, this is separate now, we're done with PPP for a second. Uh, if you're a large, if you are not eligible for, or you're not gonna claim PPP loan forgiveness, let's just say, there's another provision as part of the CARES Act that says an employer or self-employed individuals can defer the employer's share of the social security tax. So this is to generate more liquidity. It's not permanent. You have to pay it back in 2021 and 2022, and you can't use it if you claim PPP loan forgiveness or certain other forgiveness. So the, you know, the will banks be ready? I'm seeing different banks are ready, not ready for PPP. Again, not surprising. I think we've heard some community banks may be ready. I'd also say to the extent that you have an existing relationship with a bank, I would certainly leverage that. You know, they're, they're probably to an extent that if a bank knows who you are and you've been a longtime customer, there may be more trust there versus coming in. You know, if you just come to Wells Fargo off the street or Chase Bank off the street, uh, they're going to be maybe more hesitant or they're going to take longer to diligence it. The economic injury. So this is the other loan program a lot of people are talking about. We have just a minute left. I'll just cover it quickly. It's called EIDL loans. It's an existing SBA program. It's different than PPP. These loans are not forgivable. One. Two, you can, if you borrow more than a certain amount, you may have to pledge collateral. You may have to guarantee it as well. The one advantage these have is if you need quick cash, like in the next couple of days, there's an advance portion of this EIDL program that will give you a $10,000 grant. They claim within three days of application. I haven't heard any confirmation of that yet. And you don't even have to accept the eventual EIDL loan. You can apparently keep the advance even if you don't accept the EIDL loan. One other important, uh, important point I'd make on this is, is that the EIDL is applied through directly the SBA website. You don't go to your local lender. PPP, local lender, EIDL loan through the SBA website. And then there are restrictions, uh, Michael mentioned earlier, you know, it is possible to have an EIDL loan for a certain period and also a PPP loan. But if you're using those loans for the similar proceeds or during the same period, there can be restrictions on those two. So just be careful if you're pursuing both, you may not be able to, and you may want to decide which is better for you. And with that, I don't know, Michael, anything, I know I just, I didn't do EIDL as much justice as I should, but anything I missed? No, I think at, at this point, most people are, are really interested in the, the forgivable loan through the PPP um, loan program. And, and that's certainly probably the, the, the route people are going to be going over at least the, the next uh, course of time. So I just, we'll leave it there where I know we're at the end of our hour. We have also information here. There's another tax credit, people, large employers that maybe aren't eligible for the PPP program. There's something called an employee retention tax credit. We have it in our slides, we don't have time to cover it, but uh, when you get the deck, I'd encourage you to review that. Otherwise, I just say, thank you everyone. This is, I think for me anyway, this is the largest by far webinar I've ever hosted at Ide Bailey. So we appreciate everyone attending and we'll make best efforts to get back to people on their questions. And it may really be best practice for people to reach out to their local Ide Bailey professional. And if you're not an Ide Bailey client, find your closest Ide Bailey office and maybe make contacts there that that may be your best avenue to get an answer um, because I don't think we'll be able to give an answer to every single question. All right, so thank you all so much for attending and thank you to our presenters. Um, we did provide a link in the chat and it will direct you to our website and you can um, fill out the form and get assistance there. So once again, thank you to everyone. And if you do have any questions, um, we will just leave this open for a few more minutes so we can gather them and send them off to the presenters. So thank you all. Have a great day.